Good morning. To begin with, I want you all to take two deep breaths. Get nice and relaxed. You may not realize it, that at least one of those breaths came from plankton in the ocean, from marine plants. A more accurate answer for that will be probably eight out of uh, 10 breaths come from the ocean. So marine life is really important for controlling our climate. And climate change is, you know, simplifying it right down, it's, a, it's an equation. What goes into the atmosphere has to come back out again. If it doesn't, then that's why we have climate change. So the marine plants are really critically important in controlling our atmosphere. But we've lost 50% of all marine life since the 1950s. And because of ocean acidification and CO2 dissolving into the oceans, the pH is dropping. And as it drops to pH 7.95, then carbonate-based life forms will start to dissolve. So over the next 25 to 30 years, we could be seeing an 80 to 90% loss of marine life in comparison to the 1950s. Now we need marine life to uh, remove carbon from the atmosphere. It's life support system for the planet. So it's really critically important that we continue with carbon mitigation. We continue with achieving net zero. But we now know that if we achieve net zero by the end of this decade, which is impossible under RCP 4.5, then atmospheric levels of CO2 will still hit 500 ppm, and ocean pH will still drop to 7.95, and we lose most marine life. So we have a, a bit of a dilemma. Now, putting some figures onto this, from uh, the burning of fossil fuels and from trees, we're kicking 11.1 gigatons of CO2 as carbon into the atmosphere. And marine life and nature is taking out somewhere in the region of 5.9 uh, gigatons leaving 5.2 gigatons going into the atmosphere. That's why we have climate change, because of this imbalance in what's going into the atmosphere and what's coming out. Now, you'll also note that uh, ocean life or marine life is four times more important than terrestrial ecology. Marine life such as this organism, it's a cyanobacteria called Prochorococcus. It's responsible for 20% of all our oxygen and for removing 20% of our CO2. It's the most numerous plant on the planet. But we didn't even know it existed until 1985. You know, that shows you how little we actually know what's going on. Now, moving up the evolutionary chain, we come to uh, uh, marine phytoplankton called diatoms. Diatoms form the mineral flint. If it wasn't for diatoms, early man would not have had fire. These organisms sequester and remove an order of 45 gigatons of CO2 from the atmosphere. That's five times more than we're burning in fossil fuels. Critically important organism. Moving on to coccolithophores, these are carbonate-based phytoplankton. Again, they're removing in the region of 40 to 45 gigatons of CO2 from the atmosphere. These organisms form chalk. White cliffs of Dover are based on coccolithophores and carbonate-based life forms. Again, critically important for our environment and for the atmosphere. Now, moving up the food chain to animals, we've got copepods, the most numerous animal on the planet. And I bet you very few of you have even heard of copepods. There are five gigatons of these animals in our oceans. That's equivalent to 17 million jumbo jets. And if you lay them end to end, they go around the planet 32 times. These organisms migrate every night from a depth of 200 meters to the surface to feed on phytoplankton. And when they swim to the surface, it's the biggest mass migration on the planet, and that happens twice a day. They move more water than the moon, and the energy transfer is enormous, and that's not been factored into climate change. They consume the phytoplankton at the surface, and when they defecate, they actually uh, put out 30 times more carbon than man burns in fossil fuels. And if only 6% of the carbon they consume goes to the abyss, that locks out three gigatons of CO2. But we're losing them. Marine life is dying in the oceans. From an IPEN report funded by the Swedish and German government, we've lost 70% of all the fish since the start of the Industrial Revolution, and more than 50% of all other marine life. And that void is being filled by bacteria and protozoa. 
So all life on Earth really depends upon phytoplankton. They're responsible for 80 to 90 percent of all our oxygen, but we're killing them with toxic chemicals. We're killing the life support system for our planet. And we're doing that with pollution from effluents such as the textile industry. It's responsible for 10 percent of the global CO2 budget. It's also generating huge amounts of uh, toxic effluent. Uh, the textiles are also in microplastics, but we also have pharmaceuticals and petrochemicals. But I think the real elephant in the room here is the municipal wastewater treatment. 80% of the world has no effluent treatment for municipal waste. That's discharged into our rivers and into the sea, and when it's discharged inland, the waste ferments, it generates methane, which is 150 times more a greenhouse gas than CO2. But by way of example, you have the, the burning lakes of Bangalore, 10 million people, and that effluent is simply digesting in these lakes. Huge amount of methane that's being generated. But even in developed countries, only 10% of effluent treatment plants are fitted for tertiary treatment to remove microplastics and priority chemicals. So we're continuing to discharge these horrible chemicals and plastics into the environment. It's not sustainable. It cannot continue. And we know that because as a marine biologist, I've been responsible for designing many of the life support systems of the world's major aquariums, Dubai Mall, Lisbon, Istanbul, to name but three. We know what keeps these animals alive. And uh, all of these major aquariums, they can no longer use seawater. It's all artificial seawater because normal, uh, the, the, the seawater is too toxic for them. So we have to make up artificial seawater. If you use PVC pipes with these systems, we'll kill the animals with tributyl tin, lead, and, and UV stabilizers. Now, you know, in the ocean, we have CO2 in the atmosphere and dissolving into, through the surface of the water. But if we're losing marine life, if we're losing the plants, then the plants are not there to remove that CO2 that's dissolving in the water. The CO2 forms carbonic acid, and that drops the pH of the oceans. It's called ocean acidification, otherwise known as the evil twin of climate change. Evil because it's actually more serious than climate change, and we have completely ignored it. Now, to put some figures onto this, oceanic pH was 8.2 about 40 to uh, 1940s, 1950s. Currently, oceanic pH is 8.04, and we have lost 50% or more of all marine life. That's the red line. Now, projecting forward under RCP 8.5, which is business as usual, oceanic pH will hit 7.95 within the next 25 to 30 years. 50% of all marine life remaining in the oceans is based on carbonate they're going to dissolve. They're not going to come back if the ocean pH hits 7.95. And we know that because it's happened with our systems with marine aquaria. So we know how delicate you know, the marine ecosystem is. So if we hit pH 7.95, then the coral reefs will disappear. And we lose the ocean defenses for half a billion people. That will then set up a cascade reaction. And we could potentially lose all the whales, the seals, the birds, and the fish. And with them, the food supply for 2 billion people. That's why ocean acidification is the evil twin of climate change. And this has been almost completely ignored. And it's not climate change doing this, it's toxic chemicals, which started in the 1950s. It's the chemical revolution, not the industrial revolution that we're really concerned about. It's chemicals that are toxic forever, like DDT, PCBs, fire retardants, PVDE. And, uh, uh, and also PFOS, which is uh, a more recent chemical. But closer to home, we have oxybenzone, one of the most toxic chemicals in the marine environment. It's a cosmetic. It's in 3,500 different cosmetics. It's the active ingredient in sunblock. But it's toxic to marine life at 62 parts per trillion. All it takes is 70,000 tons of oxybenzone to wipe out most of the plankton. In cosmetics alone, we're dumping 20,000 tons of this chemical into the environment. It's also used as a UV stabilizers in plastics, paints, and adhesives, and the world manufactures 2 million tons of this chemical every year. 
and it's going to find its way into the environment unless we control that. So the marine ecosystem is in trouble. It's not just chemicals, it's plastic, especially microplastic, the plastic we don't see. It's now estimated there could be as much as 21 million tons of microplastic in the Atlantic Ocean. That's seven particles of plastic in every liter of water. Now that plastic gets into the animals, and again it's estimated that more than one in 15 of every living organism in the world's oceans contains plastic. The plastic acts like a sponge and it absorbs the chemicals such as oxybenzone and the PCBs, amplifies that chemical many thousands of times, then the zooplankton eats it and it gets injected with that chemical. And that's why the plankton is dying at a rate of 1% year on year. This is not a sustainable situation. By now you probably want to jump off a cliff because <laughs> all doom and gloom, but uh, there is hope. There is hope that we can still recover this situation because if we hadn't wiped out more than 50% of all marine life since the 1950s, the chances are we would not now be experiencing climate change. Think about that. It also gives us a potential solution because if we prevent toxic forever chemicals getting into the marine environment, if we prevent plastic getting into the oceans and breaking down to microplastic, then there is a chance we can still recover the oceans and prevent the pH dropping to 7.95 because most of the ocean biomass is actually under one millimeter in size. More than 60% of all life in the oceans is under one millimeter and it can double in mass every three days. Terrestrial ecology takes 60 years to double in biomass. So if we take the chemical breaks of the marine ecosystem, then it can recover. And if we can restore the oceans back to their condition that we had in the 1940s, 1950s, we can balance it. Even without removing all the carbon, you know, we can become carbon neutral. But the important thing is that we stop ocean acidification because we do not survive the loss of all the carbonate-based life forms. Still critically important that we achieve net zero and reduce the carbon levels as much as possible. But we need to take action now because of the huge inertia there is in the marine ecosystem. Unless we eliminate microplastics and toxic forever chemicals within the next 10 years, then ocean pH will still drop to 7.95 and we lose most of the marine life upon which we all depend. Now, this is a relatively easy fix. It's also not that expensive to do it. And, and what we have to do is eliminate pollution, especially the toxic chemical pollution and the plastic. But there's a range of things that we can do uh, you know, with water treatment, wastewater treatment, achieving um, you know, zero impact, zero discharge, and also with uh, regenerative agriculture, green pharmaceuticals, green chemistry. So there are huge opportunities here. It doesn't need to be expensive to do this. It just takes a change in behavior and an awareness of what we are doing to the marine environment. And if we have that change in behavior, then we can have a new beginning. Thank you.